our next presenters are uh, tag teaming, um, which is great. So we have Hillary Solomon and Kathy Doyle, um, one from the Polding Meadowy, I said that right, Natural Resources Conservation District, and the other from the Doyle Ecological Services at Middlebury College. And they're going to be presenting on the Flower Book Brook Watershed Phosphorus Mitigation, Landscape Assessment and Project Implementation. Solomon with the Pulte Meadowy Natural Resource Conservation District. Kathy and I conducted a landscape analysis in the Flower Brook watershed, which is located in the South Lake watershed, very uh, right at the southern tip of Lake Champlain. The Flower Brook watershed is in three towns, Tinmouth, Danby, and Pollitt. And the village of Pollitt is sort of nestled at the downstream end of the Flower Brook watershed and is um, frequently damaged by flooding. And the town itself is not very economically resilient, so this is um, particularly damaging to the town. <coughs> Most of you probably remember all the modeling that was done for the Lake Champlain TMDL. Um, where we, we looked at most specifically three of these land uses. We looked at agriculture, we looked at stream bank erosion, and we looked at forest land. Uh, most predominantly we, looked, we focused on the forest land sector. So, so the South Lake watershed had predominantly higher, proportionately higher levels of um, phosphorus coming off the forested land compared to some of the other sub-watersheds in the area. And so when the TMDL implementation plan was written, most of the other sub-watersheds for the lake were assigned about a 5% reduction as their target for phosphorus in runoff from forested lands. But the, the South Lake watershed was, um, the target was 40% reduction for forested lands. So you can see we have, we actually had, and I'm just, uh, our targets were very high, agricultural production areas, 80%, so I'm not talking about that today. But one of the reasons that, that, that these targets are all set so high is that the lake itself in our area is very, very narrow, and the land base that drains to the lake is proportionately much larger. So when they did the modeling, they saw very slow responses in the water quality, in water quality improvements, based on improved land management scenarios on the landscape. Our main, it's crazy notes here. Our main um, project goal was to try and look at our forested landscape, which was very steep up in the headwaters, and identify sources of phosphorus, and then try to also identify places in the watershed that might be sinks for <coughs> phosphorus that's being generated. We wanted to identify specific projects. The conservation district is very active in trying to implement projects on the landscape, so we wanted to we wanted to identify rest, potential restoration projects, both for water quality and also because of the flood resilience issues in Paulet. Um, and then part of it too was that we wanted to be able to communicate our information with landowners. So we wanted to be able to communicate with landowners both at the landscape scale, so they can sort of they can see where their parcel fit into the greater landscape, and we also wanted to be able to look at an individual parcel, especially some of the larger pieces and communicate similarly across the parcel to the property owner, which areas on their parcel were going to be more vulnerable to erosion and which areas were going to be a little bit more resilient if they wanted to do some land management activities. And in, as we worked through the process and tried to figure out what data we were going to use for our assessment, we had some very, some influential um, studies that, that really helped us try to weigh the different aspects of the data layer so we could come up with some meaningful way to Look at this. Look at the landscape from GIF data layers. And I just wanted to um, booth that booth at all study took place out in Washington State. But the soils were very similar to our soils. They were very sandy and gravelly. And they found that out there, the biggest indicator of water quality, maintaining water quality in the rural landscape, was your retention of forest cover. So once you drop below a certain percentage of forest cover, you started to lose water quality, no matter what other factors were still present on that landscape. And then the Underwood and Bren looked at. Um, it was a great study, looked, looked at um, flood resiliency on forested lands, and we, it was very influential in the work that we did. Our work was on a landscape that had more of a mosaic of agricultural and other land uses along with the forest lands, and we had, while their study was on public land, we didn't have any, we don't have any public lands in the flood watershed. And I think this is just a reminder, these are all the great things that forests can do for us on the landscape. We expect that they're going to attenuate nutrients and they're going to slow, they're going to decrease erosion, um, and that they have this great, all these great, you know, co-benefits that go along with having forested land. But 
what we're realizing, especially what our water quality data results are showing us in this watershed, is that if lands aren't managed properly, they can become, you know, forest land can also be sources of sediment and gravel and nutrients and flood waters downstream. And so we have this big task we're sort of assigning to forests as cleaning up the water. Um, but if they aren't managed properly, we can see detrimental results uh, downstream. And this is a picture from up in the head of the watershed. This is a, a farm up at the head of the watershed, and you can kind of notice that it's a, it's a plateau, and then behind it we drain to a steeper valley wall that goes down to the stream. And this is a pretty common thing that we're seeing in this watershed are these plateaus that are lightly used and then draining to some steeper valley walls down to the river. And um, this, this is just, I was trying to show, these are the, this is the TMDL implementation plan, and the, in 21 places, you know, we were calling on forests to help us clean up Lane Champlain. Which I guess just has, impl it has impl impl implications for future land management in these headwater areas. And one of the reasons that we picked the Flower Brook watershed is that we knew that there were existing issues in the watershed. Um, we have a lot of culverts, a lot of them are undersized. We have roads that are steep, hydrologically connected and prone to erosion. And then the pink areas on the map are areas that are severe gullies, not just little one foot deep gullies, but severe gullies. And we're gonna see photos of two, and we'll see photos of these two in a second. Oh, and our also maybe importantly also is that our water quality data is showing increased concentrations of phosphorus over time. And just to give you guys, oh, and in 2012, Flower Brook was placed on, it has a, T, has a TMDL now, it's an impaired water. So this is for bacteria, it's down in the village, um, it's not related to the forest land, but it was just one more reason why we wanted to look, focus on this watershed. And here's what the watershed sort of looks like. This is after Tropical Storm Irene, so we had lots of large woody debris and gravel recruitment into the stream. Um, this is sort of a typical gully. This is just a cross culvert across a road. It's a very, very tiny ephemeral tributary. And then this is actually a head cut. It's in an old hay field, so there's a five foot drop where this gully's starting. It's not even in a stream. It's just a place where thunderstorms and snow melts. It's kind of a bowl, so it collects water. And then the soils are also very sandy and gravelly. It's a lot of glacial till. So this, this, gull this gully stretches behind me about a quarter of a mile and at its deepest point is 50 feet deep. Mm -hmm. And the landowners talk about this, these changes happening um, starting in the early 80s. And so over the last however many years that is, them just watching these gullies forming on their lands. And then the result of all this is that all this gravel ends up in the stream. It gets carried down to the village of Pollock where there's less slope. It gets deposited there. And then the stream doesn't really have any capacity anymore to carry water during flood events or storm events. So there's a lot more flooding in the village. And I'm going to pass it off to Kathy now, who's going to talk more specifically about our maps, and then I'll be back to talk about a project that we worked on. Great, so I'm going to focus on the landscape assessment, and as Hillary mentioned, we were interested in identifying those areas that are potentially sources of phosphorus on the landscape, as well as where phosphorus might be attenuated, mostly by forest land. So here's a, um, examples of four of the models that we generated. And uh, we used ArcGIS, the spatial analysis tool pack, uh, to combine different raster layers to generate these different models. Purpose of these models was also to try to direct, as Hillary mentioned, some real concrete uh, projects on the ground. So first I'll just talk briefly about these top two models, and then I'll go into a little more detail with the bottom two. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see a model of uh, river corridors that was combined with tree canopy cover. So those, that's kind of a traditional model that the uh, district has been using traditionally to identify those areas where there's low tree cover within the riparian zone to target areas to be planted. That's very useful. We've heard of how uh, stream bank erosion is a big contributor to phosphorus. But we wanted to even move beyond this to look more at the entire landscape. In the upper right hand corner, we have a model of priority forest that was developed, that we developed, where forest might be attenuating phosphorus. So in this particular example, those areas that, um, a little washed out here, but that are um, in the darker greens are those areas that 
are um, in priority forest blocks, they have higher forest cover, they are more productive areas in terms of topoidaphic situation, um, also some wetlands, and that's going to be leading to more potential attenuation of phosphorus on the landscape. Areas in kind of the rusty brown co color, those would be areas that would be less likely to be attenuating phosphorus. In the lower left-hand corner, and I'll talk about this more later as I said, but it's basically a model of areas within the flower book, book landscape uh, that would be restoration priorities as well as conservation priorities. And finally, in the lower right here, and I'm going to get into this right next, um, is a, a model of vulnerable areas. And this is important to guide some of our outreach or the district's outreach to landowners. Um, this particular vulnerable areas model was heavily uh, based on the work that Underwood and Brin has done. We uh, did a few different things from that as well. Oops. Oops. All right, so talking about the, the model of vulnerability, um, we combine seven different raster layers, and we can think of these different layers as risk factors where the higher values for each risk factor would indicate more vulnerability to contributing uh, phosphorus. So I'll work through these different layers, um, other than the high elevation one, which I won't show you. But the, uh, in the um, top, we see the tree canopy uh, cover layer, with low tree canopy cover in the lighter colors and more tree canopy cover in the darker green. So more vulnerable areas would be those areas that have less canopy cover. We included a wetlands layer, which was a comp composite of both mapped wetlands as well as hydric soils and buffered vernal pools. Wetlands can be important in absorbing or retaining phosphorus, but if, because they, uh, uh, re they reduce erosion risk and they retain water, but they also, if destroyed or damaged, can be a source of phosphorus. So we included this in the model as a uh, factor that was created uh, some vulnerability to phosphorus. Two other layers we included. Um, on the left, you see percent slope. Those areas in kind of a rusty color would be the steeper slopes, more potential to contribute phosphorus on the steeper slopes. In the right-hand side, we have uh, hydrologic soil groups. And hydrologic soil indicates the propensity to generate runoff. So those soils that are classified as A have greater water infiltration, less capacity to generate runoff, whereas those D soils, the ones shown here in the pink, um, are more likely to generate runoff when they're wet. So those would be the ones that would be considered more at risk to uh, contributing erosion and phosphorus. Um, on the left-hand side, we, we included the layer of a uh, river corridor, and I, um, I show this here where the, the color in um, yellow is actually the Vermont Conservation Design surface water, highest priority surface water and riparian area zone, and overlaid on top of that is the DEC river corridor. So we included the Vermont Conservation Design layer because it was a little bit wider in some of these um, valley bottom areas. So we felt like that was a useful indicator of those river corridors. So because we've learned how much uh, phosphorus is contributed by stream bank erosion, obviously the river corridors are a vulnerable, uh, potentially vulnerable area. In the right, we have the development density. This was from the E911 database. The red areas shown, um, Paula Village in the kind of the left hand toe there, and one of the uh, areas at, at Danby Corners in the right, those are the reddish areas with the highest density of houses and uh, commercial buildings. The kind of uh, mustard color is rural residential areas, and the green would be the lowest density. Because of driveways, culverts, compacted soils, development density can be a really good indicator of potential um, vulnerability to contributing erosion. I'll mention here this area we'll talk about later is the Little Village Road. It has a lot of spaghetti lots, lots of culverts. You might remember that from one of the earlier slides. So it was an area that was, has been highlighted by the town as well as the Conservation District as being 
potentially uh, problematic area. So this is compiling all these different seven layers um, into one model. This is a um, composite model of vulnerability to contributing phosphorus. And those areas that are shown in red are those that are most vulnerable. And the areas in green are the least vulnerable. Um, you can see that in this Beaverbrook watershed here, uh, this portion, which had a lot of wetlands, also a lot of open um, farmland, that's a particularly vulnerable area. Um, also, we see this little brook road area with the spaghetti lots as being um, high vulnerability to contributing uh, phosphorus. So we can use this, the district can use this to help landowners think about strategies on their land for um, limiting phosphorus inputs. Another model I'd like to just briefly talk about is this model of forest restoration and conservation priorities. To, to develop this, we combine the forest tree canopy cover and multiply that by a model of forest productivity. And that was a model that uh, include topo adaptive climatic factors. It was developed by Vermont Land Trust and available through the um, Forest Atlas. And so it, it would include areas that were most productive would be those that would be um, toe slopes, lower elevation, deeper soils, that kind of thing. So when we multiply these together, you can see that in red, we would have those areas that would be most productive but currently not forested. So those would be areas we might target as restoration priorities. In the darker blues, those would be areas that are currently forested and also currently modeled to be higher productivity, so then likely to be conservation priorities. So I'm going to turn over to Hillary, and she's going to kind of wrap things up. All right. So very quickly, because I don't have any time left, um, I'm not going to tell you about this map. But um, we ended up reaching out to landowners at the forest block level. We felt like that was kind of a manageable number of landowners to deal with at once. And we have two forest blocks that we're focused on. One is the back of these little village road lots. There are these ones are the spaghetti lots like Kathy mentioned, and they go, it backs up into a nice forest block. Um, kind of difficult land management scenario there with so many parcels. And then the other is Mount Hogue, which is a forest block kind of surrounded by those roads there. Um, which has eight or so landowners, bigger parcels, a little easier to work together. The landowners actually were excited to work with us, which was nice. I was a little nervous to reach out to them. We're meeting with them on Monday, and we're going to talk with them about kind of looking at their parcel as part of a bigger ecological block. And I'm going to just, we did a <coughs> restoration project. It was pretty fun. We had this gully up on a farm field. Remember how we talked about the flat, flat land straining into something steeper? So this is actually coming across a flat surface here, but it's got some drainage coming to it. Again, only during snow melt or thunderstorms. This is not a stream. Um, the farmer was doing a little mitigation on his own. <laughs> but the water kept running behind or in front of his um, things he was putting in there. And so we, we, we kind of reshaped, we took stuff out, we reshaped wood blocks and different materials and made these like check dams. They were about three feet tall, so hoping to capture some sediment, raise the level of the bottom of that gully. Did a lot of plantings around with native plants. Um, farmer was super helpful. It was way back, you know, to a pretty remote site. Helped us get materials there. Um, this was it after we were done. We actually used firewood to stabilize some of the head cuts at the, I think at the tops of the gully. And then um, made it through a couple thunderstorms and a couple snow melts. We had like three different snow melt events last winter. Um, it looked great this summer, actually filled in pretty well. Um, here's some more pictures of it. This is the firewood cobbled area that we made at the entrance. It silted in really nicely, started growing some plants. Everything actually looks pretty good, so we're gonna, kind of waiting. Finally, we fence the cows out so the plants can grow now, <laughs> and we're going to see what it looks like um, in a couple of years, but I'm hopeful. And we just we needed something like this with all the gullies, something kind of low-tech and inexpensive. Um, so we're hoping word of mouth sort of gets out, and we can do some more projects like this. Yeah. <laughs>